welcome to your at-home worship this week, and we begin with prayer, and prayer is such a gift. In, in prayer, we draw closer to God, and in prayer, we're able to bring all of our burdens and set them aside. So that's how we'll begin our worship, and in particular, with Luther's morning prayer, a really wonderful prayer that we can all um, uh, memorize so that we can have it on our heart and our lips whenever we need it. But now let us use it to begin our worship. Let us pray. I give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected me through the night from all harm and danger. I ask that you would also protect me today from sin and all evil so that my life and actions may please you. Into your hands I commend myself, my body, my soul, and all that is mine. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. The best way for us to commend ourselves to God is to stop trying to, to get everything in our life in order, because in a way, that's holding on to our lives, and instead just to bring it all before God. And we do that here with the confession and forgiveness. We confess those areas of our life that um, if, if it was a house and God showed up, we'd be embarrassed for God to walk in that room. But God has a word for even those places in our life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's children say, Amen. God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you and against others, both knowingly and unknowingly. You call us to love, and we hate. You call us to peace, and we bring violence. You call us to be generous, and we are greedy. Lord, for these sins, and all that we confess now in the silence of our hearts, we have merited your wrath. Forgive us, Lord. And so now receive your absolution. When we began the confession, we said that our Lord has a word for even those places in our lives that we might want to treat, try and keep quarantined off. And that word is a word of forgiveness. That word is that every, every part of our lives is covered with the blood of the Lamb, that we are washed as white as snow, and so receive all that in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All your sins are forgiven. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now, uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grand Creator, everything, everything was, was brought, brought into being with the, the word on your lips. lips. Speak to us again. Recreate us by the power of your word. Amen. And our lector this week is LaDonna. Thank you, LaDonna. A reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters, so God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. 
God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the day, the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear, earth, that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be light in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for, and for days and years, and let them, let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God, God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that, they, that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image in the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed, that is upon the face of the, all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food, and it is so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. There ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Well, I've come to learn that referencing Seinfeld never goes over well. 
but you know, I can't help myself because the show is a masterpiece. The care and craft that went into it are just delightfully conspicuous. And the, the intricacy with which the jokes are set up and the aplomb with which the punchlines are delivered, you know, it betrays the very premise upon which the show itself was created. In case you didn't already know, and I hope you do, but Seinfeld is famously about nothing. Seinfeld is the show about nothing. A car lost in the parking lot, gum chewing, a wink, soft talkers, waiting for a table, traffic, and yada, yada, yada. These are all fair game for the show. And rather than landing flat, these non-starters turn out to be the raw material for some of the best television ever created. Now, that's a bold claim, but I'm not the only one making it, and it holds up. The genius of Seinfeld was the creator's realization that all those parts of life we consider insignificant are really the prime material for great comedy. In the writer's room, the way they'd come up with episodes were the writers would tell stories and the one rule was it had to be from real life. Didn't matter how insignificant. You see, they, the creators of Seinfeld were onto something. When you review the opus of the show, you've got to hand it to them this idea that nothing is really great material. There's something to it. And you know, isn't that true of all the best parts of life? Nothing is the raw material for all those things that make life worthwhile. Like love and joy. Not unlike a, a good joke, you don't see the best bits of life coming. You can't anticipate them. They always look like nothing at the outset. But once they land, well, once they land, they leave you gobsmacked and over the moon and doubled over. And you know, that's the very essence of humor, in fact. It's how jokes work. The technical term for this is subversion of expectation. Subversion of expectation. Uh, what makes a joke funny is that you don't anticipate the punchline. The punchline subverts what you were expecting. Now, all of us know the best way to ruin a joke is to explain one. The best thing is to stand on the receiving end of one. So let's have a joke. And since I know <laughs> that Seinfeld jokes, they never go over well, I'll tell one in Norm MacDonald's honor instead. It's been making, this joke has been making the rounds on social media. It's his famous uh, Russian moth joke. And I'm no Norm MacDonald, but I'll try to do it justice. So, a moth goes to a podiatrist's office. And the podiatrist says, what's the problem? And the moth says, what's the problem? Where do I begin, Doc? I go to work for Gregory Ilanovic, and all day long, I work. Honestly, Doc, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. I don't think even Gregory Ilanovic knows. All I know is that he has power over me, and that seems to bring him joy. But I don't know, Doc. I wake up in a malaise every day. And the podiatrist says, oh, yeah? And the moth says, yeah. Uh, he says, at night sometimes I, I wake up and, uh, and I turn to some old lady that's in my bed, a lady that I once loved, Doc. I don't know where to turn. My youngest, Alexandria, she fell in the cold last year. The cold took her down as it did many of us. And my younger boy, Gregaro Ivanovilovic, I no longer love him. This is the hardest pill to swallow, Doc, as much as it pains me to say when I look in his eyes, 
All I see is that same cowardice I catch when I look at my own face in the mirror. He says, Doc, sometimes I feel like a a spider even though I'm a moth. I feel like I'm just barely hanging on to my web with an everlasting fire beneath me. Doc, I'm not feeling good. And so the podiatrist says, Moth man, you're in trouble. But you should be seeing a psychiatrist. Why on earth did you come here to a podiatrist? Why, the moth says, because the light was on. All right, well, I'll have more to say about that joke in a second. Hopefully it at least tickled your funny bone just a little. Because for now, it's enough to say that it's a mystery why it is that uh, wise cracks tickle our funny bone. No one knows for sure why we enjoy having our subversions or having our expectations subverted. Likewise, there's no definitive reason why a punchline makes us laugh. But God help us, they do, don't they? Now, there's no, uh, there's no way to prove this, but I, I have a theory. I have a theory why it is we like having our expectations turned on their ear. And the reason for this is because, as today's scripture says, we are made in the image of God. And if scripture is to be trusted, and it is, then God is the original humorist. After all, what else is the resurrection except the greatest subversion of expectation in the history of the world? We all thought the cross was the end, but then Easter Sunday proved to be the punchline that took the wind out of death's sails. You see, the empty tomb is a subversion of expectation. And that's not God's only move like Norm's joke that we just had. God delights in a, in a superfluous setup. Part of Norm's joke is that you know that the moth is going to say, well, uh, because the light was on. But part of what makes the joke funny is just this elaborate setup that keeps going. You see, God's punchline to the resurrection is like that too. The whole setup is a masterpiece. Like an episode of Seinfeld, creation is an elaborate setup for the punchline of the empty tomb. And, like an episode of Seinfeld, God uses a whole bunch of nothing to pull off the gag. God uses nothing. The nifty phrase for this in Hebrew is tohu vavohu. That has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Tohu vavohu. You can put it in your back pocket. Tohu vavohu. (laughs) Now, tohu vavohu is the evocative phrase that is blandly translated in our Bible as formless void. But basically, tohu vavohu is the grist of nothing itself. Tohu more or less means wasteland, and vohu means emptiness. See, that's what God's working with at the beginning. The whole setup for the punchline of amazing grace is nothing, literally nothing. Tohu vavohu. Nothing is everything God needs. It turns out Seinfeld is excellent training for a sophisticated theological imagination. And so this week when your friends ask you out, uh, tell them that you can't. Tell them that you've got to watch Seinfeld. Tell them on, on your pastor's orders, you've got to brush up on Seinfeld. Now, I know you all like to think that I I come up with this stuff on my own, but the truth is the principle that God creates out of nothing, it's it's a bedrock theological principle. In fact, there's a fancy term for it, ex nilio, ex nilio, out of nothing, nilio, nil, as they say in tennis and soccer. God creates ex nilio out of nothing. God creates with tohu vavohu. But ex nilio really is just another way of saying that the best things in life come from nothing. That God, in all the wisdom thereof, has determined to bless nothing, to make all the good stuff out of nothing. Isn't that why today's scripture keeps repeating itself? 
good after God works with a batch of nothing and makes the material for the next day of creation. It says it's good. God loves working with nothing, but that's not all. God's good at it, and what God makes from it is good. God's no cut-rate comedian or theologian for that matter. God is a master craftsman of all that stuff that makes for great jokes and life and love too, and joy and hope, and miracles. All that stuff the world regards as nothing, including yours, that is right where God loves to speak, what God uses to make God's very good. Nothing is everything God needs for the superfluously splendid, delightful, and lovely creation of all of this and what God uses for recreation too, resurrection, that new life in Christ you've been baptized into. But I like recreation for right now, especially when you push those two words right together, recreation. Those places that have all the makings of nothing, your losses, your dashed hopes, your fears, your grief, your failures, and your betrayals too. These are the tohu vavohu, the ex nihilo that God unexpectedly creates out of and subversively speaks into. Your disorder, darkness, and death, they are the raw material God uses to shape a Genesis week out of the chaos of your life. Is there some place in your life that looks like nothing good will come of it? And I know there is because we all have them. You see, the odds are that place, rather than being God forsaken, is right where Jesus is setting up his stool and mic stand to deliver his punchline that raises the dead and forgives the sinner. And so are you ready for such a punchline? But be prepared because this punchline is as short as it is sweet. It is subtle in its own way. On the very word of the author of creation itself. By the power of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus, the beginning himself and the end too. And through the Holy Spirit hovering among us right now in these words. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all your sins are forgiven. The nothing of sin and death is right where Jesus speaks his everything into and gives it all to you and to me. And so may this word echo through your past and your present and your future too. May it turn every last expectation on its ear. May it transform those empty patches of your life into the fertile ground of paradise. May it leave you doubled over with Sarah-like laughter. And may it transform this very moment into the blessed seventh day of creation where all there is to do is wander the wild whereby of recreation itself. Chuckling over the good fortune of finding paradise restored in the last place, in the last way anyone ever expected. Pretty subversive, isn't it? The response to the word is a word of faith. So with the whole church, let us confess the Christian faith. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so now we continue our worship with the prayers of intercession. And after each intercession, I will conclude our prayer with, Lord, in your mercy. And the response is, hear our prayer. And so, on account of Christ's mercy, let us bring our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need before the Lord. O Lord, you are the one. You are the one who made the earth and heaven. Lord, for us on this side of the grave, we think it's up to us to keep that operation up and running. And indeed, you have called us to vocations, but it is not our job to replace you. We ask that you would give us faith to trust you to keep the operation of what you have made going so that we may faithfully serve our vocations that you have placed us in, in our careers, in our volunteering, and in our relationships, and in our friendships. That we may do these not with a sense of obligation, but with joy, freedom, and love, and that we may share that with those we'll find ourselves serving. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, it was you who made the earth and heaven. And in the mystery of your love, on this side of the grave, here on earth, you have set up the church as little outposts of your kingdom, as places where we might come to hear the promises that this life of ours isn't just uh, something that random, that happened at happenstance, but it is something that you have ordained. It is something that you care about and watch over. Lord, we ask you to make us into uh, a place where people can come and know that they'll hear those promises. We ask you to make us into a people where others can gather right alongside with us shoulder to shoulder and know that love, know that belonging of being called into your great family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, it was you who made the earth and heaven. O oh Lord, you know that prayer. You taught it to us, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, all of us in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones, in the life of those we find it difficult to love, and in the life of the world, we all have these places where it seems as though your will is not happening. Your kingdom is not coming. And so now in the silence of our hearts, we bring those places before you now. O oh Lord, in the mystery of your cross, bring your will to bear, your kingdom to come, even on those places we just prayed, and especially in those places that we just prayed. And help us to trust that hidden in them, under the shadow of the cross, is your work, and perhaps that you've called us there to be emissaries of your love and grace and mercy. Strengthen us as we find ourselves in those places to be your ambassadors. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Lord, those who have experienced for themselves what we just prayed about are those who have died. And their death, which looks to be like that place where your kingdom is furthest and your will is, is weakest, experience that by Christ's death on the cross. Now death is the gateway to your kingdom. And by the power of Jesus' will not to lose a single one of us, our death becomes the means whereby he gives us his life eternal. And those who have died in the faith, having experienced all that, having their faith turned to sight, are gathered around your throne and they sing your praises that never end. And so, Lord, each one of us in our little home church, we ask you to make this promise true for us and to gather us around the throne along with them and to sing praises with them as well. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And so now we raise these prayers and all that go unspoken to you, O God, in the name of the one who is, who was, and who is to come, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now our worship continues with the thanksgiving for the word. After each prayer of thanksgiving, I will conclude with, for your word of life, O God, and the response is, we give you thanks and praise. And so now, let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God. We give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God. We give you thanks and praise. And through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God. We give you thanks and praise. And so now send your spirit of truth, O oh God, rekindle your love within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. And so we prepare to conclude our worship with a word of praise on our lips. Our hymn is God Who Made the Earth and Heavens. Let us sing together.
The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so we conclude our worship with that prayer Jesus himself taught us to pray. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we invite you to stick around for a few brief announcements right after this. But now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessings. We pray that this word of God's grace that we heard about in today's service, that it, it might not just be a theoretical word, but that it would be a word that would interrupt your life, that it would uh, subvert all your expectations, that it would show up in the last way, in the last place you might expect, and that it might uh, turn every expectation on its ear, make a Genesis week out of your life, a Genesis week that's ordered, <laughs> not by rules, but by God's love that knows no bounds. And we especially pray this, if it's your first time finding your way to worshiping with us through the World Wide Web, welcome. Uh, we'd love to get to know you better, and so if you'd like to do that, just click through the Contact Us and uh, shoot us an email, and we'd love to be in touch that way. And along those lines, if you want to know what's going on, our website's pretty much up to date, and you can peruse through there and see what's going on. But it's the usual kind of fall stuff. Sunday school, confirmation, Bible study. We got a book group going. So if you're interested in any of those, you can just let us know. Otherwise, then um, we do have in person services on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. at Faith Lutheran here. And beforehand, there's Sunday school. So if you'd like to worship us with us that way, uh, that'd be wonderful. We'd certainly, we'd love it. Uh, otherwise, then really the only other announcement is that. Every Friday, we send out an email that has a link to the at-home service, this service, and then it's got just a few brief bullet points on what's going on. And so if you'd like to be on that email list, you can just let us know. Otherwise, that's everything, okay? And so we just pray that the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that it, it would be with you on account of uh, God's grace and um, by the power of the word that we heard in our sermon, that, it, that all those gifts, that they might be yours. Mm -hmm.